afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Perform Colloquium End-to-End -end Design of Deep Learning for Computational Pathology. Our speaker today is Dr. Maddie Hossini. Dr. Hossini is an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science and Software Engineering at Concordia University. Before we begin the talk, I would just like to ask everyone uh, to hold your questions until the end of the talk. Uh, if you do have a question, you can enter your question using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen, and we'll do our best to answer all questions at the end. Thank you very much, and over to our speaker now. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, just allow me uh, to share my screen. Okay, perfect. Uh, so thanks for joining in. Uh, it's, I'm excited to give this talk uh, about end-to-end -end design of deep learning for computational pathology. But before I start, maybe I should can, uh, briefly introduce myself. My name is Mari, uh, Mari Hosseini. I'm an assistant professor in computer science uh, and software engineering department at Concordia University. I'm also a faculty member at AI Institute at Concordia. My research mainly covers broad topics with foundational research in deep learning and computer vision with focused application in computational pathology. Well, pathology, computational pathology, AI and pathology are the new rivals. And uh, it is something that, you know, like uh, there's, uh, it, it is a topic that many people that might actually ponder what it is. Uh, well, when you hear pathology or histopathology, well, obviously, if you have some uh, you know, if you heard it back in the in the past, you might actually guess what it is. But like today, what are we going to do? Like we're going to the whole process of you know how the data is uh, is is generated from the clinical pathology. Uh, how do we actually collect these data, digitize this data, and then how do we actually collaborate with our uh, pathology experts, with medical experts, to annotate them, to create uh, you know uh, AI annotated type of data so that AI can learn from them. And then uh, if, if times allow, I might actually briefly talk about like, you know, my own research about, you know, uh, these developing these models. And then uh, briefly just, you know, talk about like, you know, how is it really done, like, you know, to develop these models. And then like, you know, how do we associate these into a computer aided diagnostic systems to develop like you know, some meaningful tools for the pathologist to assist in their cancer diagnostics. That is the really the vision of the pathology. So it's like about developing CAT system at the end. So it becomes an assistive tool in their clinical diagnostic workflow. Okay, um, I should probably, yeah. Okay, so mainly I my the outline of my presentation are threefold. So the first I'm going to talk about the introduction to computational pathology. I'm going to talk about from a data centric viewpoint of the pathology, my own work, as well as you know some model centric approaches from my own work as well, if the times allows. Okay, so um, what is really computational pathology? Um, <clears throat> if you want to actually view this, you can actually view this as a cycle of stages that uh, the medical experts, we call them the pathologists, right? So they, they are called pathologists uh, and uh, technicians, the IT departments, the computer scientists, engineers all get together to start to develop a meaningful activity, which the end goal is to develop an application that becomes meaningful as an assistive tool for the pathologist in cancer diagnosis. How do we do this? Um, well, maybe I should give a bit background about clinical pathology and how it actually really, uh, you know, uh, we collect the data in pathology in clinical pathology in general. Well, when it comes to clinical pathology, right, um, let's say, God forbid, somebody has a cancer, then uh, the patient gets referred to a specialist, usually a radiologist, and the radiologist uh, takes, you know, scans like let's say MRI, CT scans, and so on. Like, you know, depends on the, you know, the organ and the disease. Uh, but more or less, uh, majority of these imaging modalities are highly limited in terms of image resolution. So the what happens that in order to become a more efficient and more actually, uh, you know. Uh, more detailed to, to perform more detailed analysis on the anatomical tissue level, the, uh, the patient gets referred to the pathologist. And the, the pathologist, uh, actually the patient first gets referred to a surgeon. Um, either they have to take a biopsy or reject the, uh, you know, the tissue 
uh, assuming that it's 100% a cancer. Uh, and then uh, the tissue, it gets uh, sent to the pathology lab. So when they receive the, uh, you know, the tissue, they start to actually prepare the tissue. It's called the uh, tissue preparation process. So the tissue gets actually washed with, chem uh, with uh, several chemical processes, including, you know, um, formalin, formalin wash, which actually they <clears throat> wash all the proteins from the tissue. And what happens that you get a basically a transparent block uh, that contains the anatomical structure of the tissues. Uh, they mount it in the paraffin, so it becomes basically a, basically a block of a tissue. And then they start to slice it using the microtome. Once you have a sliced tissue, and the thickness of this slice is something between four to seven micrometer. So once you have that slice, the, depending on the severity of the cancer, like you know, the type of the disease, the organs, uh, the pathologist might ask for a different colorization process. This colorization process calls the tissue staining. So tissue gets stained or colorized. And we have more than 1,000 staining protocols. But the majority of them, more than 90% of the staining protocols, is done with hematoxylin and eosin, which we call it h &E staining. So once the tissue gets stained, dependent on the, the, you see, the tissue structure, they absorb different stains, right? Different levels of stains, and they start to contrast from each other. So once they contrast, so it becomes basically visible under the microscopy. So that's the whole basically purpose of the tissue staining. Once you just uh, stain the tissue, you put it on the glass slide, uh, they, they put a cover slip and that there you go, that becomes a tissue slide. Usually the size of these tissues are one by three inches. Well, depending on the, uh, how big is the tissue, for example, if uh, we are studying, you know, human's brain or like a monkey's brain, this obviously this is not going to uh, fit into, uh, you know, small, you know, size, one inch by three inch. We have different ranges of, you know, glass slide tissues, but more common ones are one by three uh, inches of the tissue slides. Um, and the convention of doing this for more than 150 years is that they put these tissue slides under microscopy, right? And the pathologists start to study the tissue. Uh, well, as I said in the beginning, depending on the severity of the cancer, depending on the complexity of the tissue, the disease, they might actually need more ma different magnification levels. So they opt in uh, different zooming uh, lenses, and then they start to, you know, uh, zoom in into different levels of the tissue, and then they hover the, uh, hover over the tissue and they perform their diagnosis. Well, um, that is the, uh, you know, the optical microscopy, but uh, for the past, you know, a few years, digital pathology has been rising and uh, we have seen actually more profound scanning tools because this is a high-tech scan. Uh, what happens is that digital pathology is the digitized version of the optical microscopy. So uh, let's assume that the, the pathologist, instead of looking at its you know, binocular um, microscopy, um, they, they will actually, uh, they will have the tissue in a digitized form on the uh, on the on their on their monitor, right in their office, and obviously they want to hover over the tissue. The same uh, in the same concept that the uh, optical microscopy provides. You want to actually zoom in. Uh, you want to hover over different you know uh, positions of the tissue, and then they want to, to perform their diagnosis. So what it means is that they have an LIS laboratory information system. Uh, which they start to, you know, pro, uh, input their diagnostics, and at, at the end of the day, they have their diagnostic report, which sends back to the, uh, you know, the pathology lab, and then it gets, gets communicated to the patient and the pertinent doctors. Um, so, digital pathology scanners we call the whole slide image scanners. How it is really done is that you put the, uh, you mount the same glass tissue slides inside the scanner, uh, and using the same optical structure, which we need two lenses, like an you know, objective lens, tube lens. If you, remember, if you recall from the Galileo's concept, right? You put the tissue there, there's a light condenser, and then the tissue starts to get shined. And then using two lenses, uh, it becomes basically magnified and that there's a digital camera that receives, perceives this image, and then you can digitize it. Well, there are several, uh, you know, pillars to that. First of all, it is highly resoluted. Um, so it, it is done in 
a raster scan. So we call it the strip scan. So it is done in the strip scans, they stitch together and then becomes basically the whole slide image. And also because it's highly high resolution actually imaging, um, the tissue itself is not a two dimensional surface. It's actually a three dimensional at a train in microscopic level. So the stage needs to actually move in micrometer level to make the tissue basically in focus with respect to the objective lens. Well, you can guess because it's digitized format, it involves a lot of actually computer algorithms. Uh, the tissue can actually easily get out of focus um, or even the in the tissue preparation process, the tissue is not well mounted on the glass slide. So at the end of the day, you might actually get out focused images. So you might want to actually develop some quality check control to make sure that these tissue slides are uh, well scanned uh, so we can actually provide them after that to the pathologist. So once that is done, uh, then you have a whole slide image. So let's actually talk about the structure of these whole slide images. They are in gigapixel format. What it means is that let's say you have a one centimeter by one centimeter tissue scanned at quarter of micron per pixel, meaning that each pixel corresponds to quarter of micron tissue size. You will end up collecting around 40,000 by 40,000 uh, image size. Well, uh, that was the tissue slide that you, I just showed you. It was one inch, which is like around three, three, in, three centimeter uh, uh, times like nine centimeters, something like that, right? So that is the uh, maximum size perhaps the, the tissue slide can fit in the specimen tissue. So our specimen tissues, depending on which organ it's coming from, they might actually even consume more higher areas, like you no know, big, bigger areas. So more or less, you will end up around like, you know, a couple of gigabyte of data from each tissue slide, right? And it is actually gigapixel. So for instance, what are you looking at here is a, uh, it, this is a resected tissue from breast. Uh, it is actually an invasive carcinoma breast. And the, uh, the, uh, the number of the pixels in both uh, you know, axes is something around 83,000 and 150,000 image. Let's actually take a look at digest that, what it means, right? So what the pathologists are actually dealing with. So it means that if you want to actually focus on a certain area, you need to still focus more because there are more detailed stuff there. Well, this is not still enough perhaps because you want to even you know, focus more. Then you want to actually focus into even more specified focused area and even actually more if you want, right? So to, to get the details of the cellular tissues, you know, anatomical tissue structures to make sure that everything is fine. Um, so as you can imagine, this is a very, this is a highly cognitive workload that actually puts on the shoulders of the pathologist um, uh, to, to, to make a diagnosis. Maybe before I proceed, I'd like to actually give you a live demo presentation of the same tissue from TCGA, TCGA NIH, which is an online repository uh, from the US government. Uh, the same tissue, that, what, this is what the pathologist is gonna see in front of themselves. And then once they want to diagnose, um, once they, once, once they want to diagnose, what happens is that they actually focus into the tissue, right? So you zoom in, this is actually virtual microscopy. So you zoom in, let's say I wanna actually focus on these areas, they might be actually tumorous areas, right? So you zoom in until you reach to your satisfaction level, right? And then you perform your diagnosis. Well, that's not the end of it because this is just only part covering a portion of the tissue, you want to actually hover over to different areas. Just to take a look at this area, this is actually uh, the tissue map here. So it is basically the compass of my tissue. It's a tissue landscape. Uh, I can actually go and like, you know, collect different areas that I want if I want to remain in the same zooming level and I uh, don't want to zoom out. So I can actually easily go into different areas. Assuming you have a stable internet connection, you will actually receive it online, right? And then you want to perhaps maybe zoom out to see like, you know, what are the surrounding tissues and so on. And as you can imagine, this is a highly cognitive workload. So equivalent of this, maybe you can actually, uh, you know, um, compare this with somebody goes on the football field and start to actually, uh, you know, study the every in every grass to make sure that all of them are fine, right? So that's the equal and cognitive workload. So it actually takes a lot of the pathologist time. Um, so 
Well, so the, so once we have this digital pathology, well, there's a lot of actually advantage to that. So once you have this digital pathology, you know, platform, the pathologists can share online via cloud nowadays uh, with different collaborators, with different actually colleagues all around the world to ask for their second, third, or even high, more number of opinions, right? To make sure that what they're diagnosing is correct. Uh, well, by the way, just let me give you, uh, give you a reminder that because of these highly complex, you know, tissue structures, uh, asking for second opinion, even more number of opinions from their colleagues is a very common approach. And in fact, it's actually embedded into their curriculum training. So as you can imagine, like the, you can right away think of why not we can take these digital slides and start to develop something you know meaningful and it becomes even more sense like the more actually it makes more sense once you deal with high throughput whole slide imaging what it means is that imagine that in a clinical pathology let's say in chum hospital in montreal right which they have fully digitized their workflow in a day there is a flow of between 1,000 to 2,000 slides, you know, pure slide preparation from their, from their laboratory. It's a big laboratory. And then uh, if you want to digitize it, you're ending up with around terabytes of data that you deal with, right? Um, the question is that you, you want to just basically stay at the digital pathology level. Obviously not. You want to perhaps incorporate these AI tools, which has been, you know, the hype nowadays to make some, you know, meaningful diagnostic systems to assist their pathologists because they uh, because they are uh, relying on the second opinion and more, uh, the, the vision is that the AI can easily actually help uh, to, to basically uh, to compensate for that. So what, the way we do this, we collaborate with pathologists. Let's say that we want to develop cancer disease, you know, the AI for cancer diagnostics. So, well, obviously right from the beginning, we know that tissue should comes from the breast organ. And then what happens is that we consult with the pathologist. When I say we, it means that the community of the computational pathology is not myself, just, you know, just a disclaimer here. Um, so we actually consult with the pathologist to see that what they're looking for. Well, obviously, right in the beginning, they say, they, they wanna say that, they, they might actually tell you that, I want you to actually screen my tissues to make sure that you can perhaps triage it, triage basically my cases. You know, uh, give me the cases that you think that there are cancers there. And if you think that there are cancers there, tell me where are those cancers, right? So once the pathologist asks for that, we actually reflect it back. We say, okay, well, this is what you want then what it means is that you need to collaborate with us. I'm gonna develop like, you know, an, a user interface software so you can start annotating data. So the pathologist starts annotate data on the, uh, you know, the tissue level and uh, it becomes annotated or labeled tissues. Once you have these metadata, which is the domain expert knowledge from the pathologist, then that is the beginning of the, uh, the journey for the computer scientist because you have the digital data which is gigapixel format. And on top of that, you have metadata. And it means that you can put them together and develop some meaningful uh, machine learning models nowadays with deep learning models, right? So once you train your model, your model becomes a replica of, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the pathologist. So in order to train that model, you need uh, a meaningful architecture, deep learning architectures to represent those tissues. These architectures, what are they really is that, uh, you know, it takes the, uh, the tissues, the images, processes them, and makes a high level abstraction of these images to become meaningful for, let's say, classification or like you know, even more different type of applications. Well, obviously for that, you need label data, which comes from our previous annotations. And then you need some optimization algorithms to put them together, blend them together to make up pre-trained models. Once you have that pre-trained model, right? You can actually associate that into uh, some meaningful process for prediction responses. So uh, all I want to say is that the architecture, once it's trained, it becomes a replica or synthetic pathologist that performs a similar job that the pathologist did during the annotation. Um, I'm gonna skip this slide. I will come back to this slide you know, after because uh, I want to say, like want to emphasize that maybe I can just cover it now. Uh, you know, there are sheer volumes of you know, weekly 
annotated data in our community, meaning that because they are very highly resoluted images, we cannot just ask the pathologist to you know, sit and annotate for us. They are very expensive personnel, right? Uh, so uh, you will see uh, the data is flowing to our community, like you know, in a very weak form supervision, annotated forms uh, versus strong supervision. And then what we do as a computer scientist, we develop like you no know, tools to kind of you know leverage from these representations in a weekly annotated form, and then downstream them to tasks, to more supervised tasks, to make it more meaningful for our application in uh, interest that in the application of the interest that we have in mind. Um, so. Uh, as I was saying that, you know, once you have the pre-trained model, the question is that really, how do you want to, uh, you know, present this pre-trained model, which is a synthetic pathologist, right? It's an engine, basically. How do you want to really present it to the user? The user here, again, is the pathologist. Become this, this wants to become an assistive tool to the pathologist, is a second opinia, uh, opinionator to the pathologist. Well, uh, this is where the software developers, the software engineering actually kicks in using their actually knowledge background. We develop meaningful softwares to make it, you know, more user friendly, interactive with the pathologist so they can actually, you know, interact with the AI to make sure that they, uh, they, they, they actually sign out these cases more efficiently and more profoundly. Uh, different types of applications really on the diagnostic level exist. For example, you want to detect mitosis figures, right? Um, uh, you want to detect, let's say, uh, you know, uh, where, uh, where the tissue has been metastasized, where they have not metastasized. You might want to actually dig, dig in more. You want to classify different, you know, tissues, uh, or you want to do diagnosis, you know, say, let's say tumor grading, like, you no, know, this is a normal stage one or two or three cancers, four cancers. Uh, even more, you want to actually segment the tissue and basically provide a visual guide like navigation guide to the pathologist so they can focus better on the tissue level because once again, that was the gigapixel image, right? Or even the AI can help us in developing prognostic tools that can be given this tissue, maybe we can predict the survival of the patient, how much, you know, the survivability rate is and accordingly we can actually, you know, uh, you know, the oncologist can take care of, uh, you know, the outcome of the pathologist as well as the AI to see how they can actually proceed with their chemotherapy, uh, you know, processes. So once we develop these CAT tools, obviously this needs to be clinically evaluated. Uh, and, and once they click uh, the pathologist, do, does they do the clinical evaluation according to the feedback we might want to actually consult again with them to collect more tissues. Maybe there's something wrong if the digitization, so we got we got to go and address it in the uh, you know digitization department. Um, maybe we need more annotated data or labeled data. So it means that we're going to ask the pathologist to perform more annotations for us, or something that was went wrong during the development of these AI tools. So we got to we got to go back and revise them. Or maybe the UI software, the CAT software, is not really user friendly. So we got to consult with our, you know, software engineers to make sure that the UI is more user friendly, more efficient, and it can be well integrated to clinical pathology. So if we, if I really want to put it into perspective, how the, uh, you know, the CAT tools, the CAT software tools, can be helpful in clinical pathology, uh, let's actually take a look at the, you know, just the digital pathology workflow. So the patient biopsy comes in to the pathology lab, right? And then once it gets digitized by the digital scanner, you, you need this IMS basically, uh, you know, uh, department image management system, you know, software, and takes these digital slides and communicates them to pathologist's office to for diagnosis. Uh, once they do their diagnosis, right? They sign out these clinical uh, reports, and then they send it back to the pathology uh, lab to be communicated back with the patient and their, you know, uh, to follow up, uh, to follow up with their, you know, uh, with, with their therapy. Um, so the vision in, in uh, computer-aided diagnosis, the CAT tools or AI pathology, it could be actually envisioned in three different phases, according to the pathology workflow, so clinical pathology workflow. The clinical pathology workflow uh, can be vision to three different stages called pre-analytical phase, analytical phase, and post-analytical phase. In pre-analytical phase, 
Uh, it's about the tissue preparation all the way to become basically whole slide image, which is a digital image. So as you can see that the AI can help to check the quality control uh, or even actually uh, perform some natural language processing on the preliminary you know, uh, linguistic data, we call it the, uh, the EMR data, right? Uh, or even probably can triage cases. So provide more actually suspicious slides to the pathologist because imagine that the pathologist per day, they go through you know, uh, rounds of like you know, 100 to 200 slides coming from like you no know, 40, let's say cases, patient cases. And it takes actually more than like you know, half of their day to, you know, the, to just sign out these cases. Obviously they want to triage these cases. If you can triage these cases meaningfully, it means that they can consume better of their fruitful time because it fatigue is going to get involved. So you can you want to actually more better triage these cases to better use of their actually diagnosis um, efficiency. Uh, there are more actually, uh, you know, steps could be actually think of for pre-analytical. In analytical phase, it's mainly just called a diagnostic phase. The AI can help in detecting the cancer, classifying the cancer, segmenting the areas of the tissue, make prognostic treatment, uh, as well as prediction of the treatment response uh, as well. So this is called, uh, you know, analytical or slash diagnostic phase. So once the pathologist actually really performed these diagnoses, perhaps with the help of the AI, right, in the, in the next coming future, uh, he, uh, then, then what they what they do in clinical pathology, they sign out. And these sign outs actually takes a lot of their time. So you might want to actually deploy the AI to auto-populate these diagnostics reports to help them expediting the, you know, the clinical workflow. So the benefit of the AI really is that expediting the diagnostic workflow, reducing their fatigues, and as well as increasing their precision diagnostics. So this is actually all game. Okay, so um, I would like to also bring your attention to our upcoming survey review paper, uh, which I have been actually doing this for more than two years now. Uh, there are 20 people that are really involved in our study, uh, which we just said that we're going to submit it actually tomorrow. So this is actually a good highlighted news. Uh, it was gonna become available through archive uh, next week. So you can actually check for that. So, uh, the title is Computational Pathology, a Survey Review. Uh, and actually it, it is revised right now. It's called the a Survey Review and the Way Forward. So what we did, we actually surveyed more than 700 papers in this paper because we really understood that, you know, the, the, our, our, our community is actually uh, is dealing with a big challenge, which is that despite the ongoing works from the AI, deep learning, and, you know, the digital images are coming in, and there's a lot of computational pathology, you know, applications are getting developed. Uh, there are tons of papers that are getting published, you know, for the past two years. Uh, really is that when it comes to clinical integration, it's lacking. So what we really did in this paper is that we're laying out uh, the landscape of the computational pathology to become more feasible to the community so they can actually compare their work uh, or understand what is the current, you know, uh, uh, the current uh, landscape or the structure of the computational pathology field. So we have actually, you know, surveyed more than 700 papers. It covers different broad application, organ applications. Uh, we cover the how the data are collected. We have we provide very meaningful actually tables at the appendix appendices. Uh, as well as their high-level presentations, how the actually the domain expert knowledge is annotated in you know computational pathology. How do we actually learn from these representations, and then how these the you know the evaluations uh, are done in clinical pathology and slash computational digital pathology, and what are the existing path challenges and future opportunities? It's a very sort resourceful actual paper that you can actually take a look. Uh, some of the highlights of the paper are the following: is that the, I talked about these model card. Nowadays, if somebody wants to develop the, you know, um, uh, AI, uh, you know, th they want to do research in AI, uh, the, this is actually suggested by the Google and University of Toronto that if you're doing this, then perhaps you can actually develop a model card. So uh, this model card pertains to high level, you know, information of what kind of data did we have used? What kind of models are you using? What, is, what are the applications? So we have actually innovated our own model card for the computational pathology because it has the medicinal aspects as well. It has a lot of good statistics reports, how, you know, what are the available data and so on. So you, want to, you might want to take a look. Okay, um, well, I have around 15 minutes. 
So I'm going to cover some of the parts uh, with the, with, which is going to, uh, you know, covering my own research. But before that, I really want to actually start giving you some uh, indicative factors that how computational pathology is compared to general computer vision data. So as some of you may know that when it comes to computer vision, uh, you know, uh, application, ImageNet has been the benchmark for computer vision. Well, ImageNet has been introduced back into 20, 2008, and it's finalized with the, you know, uh, 1K, uh, 1, 1K data set with 1,000 classes. Uh, it's called the ILS VRC 2012. And uh, for the past 10 years, uh, every uh, architecture, every deep learning algorithmic models that they are developed in computer vision, they got actually tested on this benchmark because it covers broad ranges of tissue classes as well as diverse represent representations of every class, okay? So a lot of number of classes and a lot of number of samples per class. And then our architectures, well-known architectures have been developed uh, and then tested, evaluated on these benchmark data set. But the problem when it comes to computational pathology is quite different. Because when you have the, the data, these data are way different in terms of representation compared to computer vision data. First of all, we don't have those abundance number of classes because it gets actually dictated by the pathologist saying that I want you to segregate, let's say between normal versus you know, cancer type one, cancer type two, and so on, right? And another actually noticeable difference is that our, uh, our classes are actually very related to each other because these are cancerous version of the same tissues, right? So really you can actually take a look at the tissue, the normal tissue as being, you know, the healthy tissue, right? Uh, and the other classes becomes the, basically the disease or abnormal ranges of the same class. But when it comes to computational pathology, it's not the same. You move from one class to another, classes are way differently represented. In fact, if I want to give you a basically, uh, you know, a concept, take a look at these trucks representations, right? So I might want to actually zoom in so you can actually better take a look at that. So these are different versions of the truck, right? Uh, we call, let's call them healthy trucks, normal trucks. Uh, what would be the equivalent version of these abnormal uh, you know, images is that perhaps when the truck gets into accident, so it becomes accidental truck. So the representation is going to be way different, right? And you can have a lot of diversities of these representations, right? So that's the equivalent, uh, you know, um, visual concept comparing the pathology versus the computer vision. And even actually the story gets even further complicated because if you move, let's say, from colon application to, let's say, breast, you're dealing with different data sets. Right? The same concept, but different data set. It means that you have to go and redo the same process. Um, and if you're, a bit, if you're a bit more familiar with the computation, you know, with deep learning and machine learning tools, uh, when you take these images and represent them in the feature domain, uh, you know, the, when you look at the, let's say, ImageNet computer vision you know, data set, they are well clustered. It means that the classes are well separable from each other. So you can really represent them in a meaningful way. But when it comes to you know, pathology, regardless whether they're healthy tissue or diseased tissue, they are very complex for representation. I'm gonna tell you why that's the case. Um, let's actually uh, uh, take a look at the uh, colon, for example. So what you're looking at is that this is a, you know, different stages of colon, like these are different types of colon polyps. And uh, so, uh, columns correspond to different colon polyps. The one at the left is the normal colon, colonic tissue. And then uh, you move from one column, uh, you know, uh, dizzy, one, one polyp version to another, you will see different representations. Perhaps it's also visually related to the healthy, but you cross across the same actually, you know, disease, they way different, you know, represented, right? Um, but, but when it comes to like the normal you know, representation, there is more consensus as opposed to the disease representation. But don't get me wrong though, when it comes to the healthy, even the healthy is way complex compared to computer vision 
actually images. Another example could be actually seen from the prostate cancer. When it comes to gleas, like because they create the gleasins, right? So gleasins, when you looking at the uh, you know uh, more you know healthy uh, you know prostate tissue, you will see that gleasins are well differentiated. They're uniformly distributed, but pro progressing with more cancerous you know type, you will see that they are way differently represented, right? So really, there's less consensus in the representation. So the question I started to ponder a few years ago, uh, almost getting to five, four years now, uh, was that I started to ask question is that, is there any way that I can learn from the healthy representation of these tissues? So maybe I can infer the cancer, right? So why? Because it's the same concept when it comes to clinical pathology. In fact, the pathology residences, they go through a curriculum training. And in their first curriculum training, they get trained with healthy tissues. We call the histology tissues, right? And once they get familiarized with those histology tissues, they go through rotations. They call the PGYs, like right, you know, years. And through those rotations, they start to see more cancerous versions. So, uh, so they can start to compare cognitively from what they learned from the healthy representation. So the question I was really asked at that time was that, can I really replicate that process? Can I learn the healthy representation? Once I learn that representation, maybe I can take that as my reference and I can compare the cancer tissues versus those healthy representation. Uh, well, this, is, this actually gave birth to the Atlas of Digital Pathology project. We call it the ADP project, which is a data-centric approach. The way it is really done is that uh, if uh, it might be actually funny if I tell you that I took few actually undergrad students from University of Toronto back into 2018, and we went together to the uh, you know um, uh, School of Medicine library, and we actually you know rented few of these histology textbooks. We brought it into our lab, and then started to actually read. You know, uh, start to familiarize ourselves to these struct different structure of the histology. And it appears that when it comes to actually the curriculum of the pathology, or the, uh, the pathology, you know, anatomical pathology, uh, they are well versed when it comes to representation, but it's a bit different though. Um, they categorize tissues into different structures such as epithelials, you know, nervous tissues, muscular tissues, and then they, every one of these uh, subcategorize and sub subcategorize. So what we did, we took that concept, and we laid out a taxonomy, uh, which is called the histological tissue taxonomy. Uh, but we revised that though, so become more adaptable you know, for deep learning. And what we did, we defined nine high level of the hierarchy of the tissue. We call it the you know, epithelial, covering epithelial connective tissues, blood, skeletal, and so on. And every one of these subcategorize and sub subcategorize. For example, you, when, you, when, uh, when you have an image, uh, it, it will have an uh, annotated labels from the epithelial, maybe stratified epithelial, or as well as stratified columnar epithelial. And in fact, uh, this, this actually covers a broad range of tissue types across the human body. So it's more like a generic type of a HTT. And actually we presented this uh, in CVPR back into you know, 2019. And we also, you know, we patented this with Huron Digital Pathology in Canada. Um, uh, our data set is composed of around 18,000 image mosaics, we call them patches. The image patch is labeled with more than one label. So it's a multi-labeled actually, uh, you know, image image. So we, the way we did this, that according to that uh, hierarchical taxonomy, we went through all of these image patches and then start to annotate everything that we saw relative. So we don't leave any tissue behind. So it's more granularly labeled. And uh, this, th this got actually uh, you know, clinically validate, evaluated by our collaborating pathologists. And you know, we published the work. And the immediate application that we actually could actually develop out of that was to actually, maybe we can highlight relevant tissues as an educational software for the pathology residences. So hey, like, let's say if, you're, if you want to consume if you want to concentrate on the, let's say, gland areas, exocrine gland areas, maybe AI can actually highlight those areas. You can actually zoom in and take a look at that, right? So it saves a lot of your time for sure. 
Uh, well, we perceive that, you know, the, the, uh, the project has been expanded a lot right now. It's actually as a big project. Um, uh, the idea was that, well, that was a very gen general, you know, uh, you know, taxonomy. Is there any way we can actually design the same taxonomy with focused organs? And the answer is definitely yes. And that's what we have done for the past, you know, two years with our collaborating pathologist. Uh, right now, we have done the same, actually, uh, taxonomy, and we are collecting the same, you know, relative tissues from, uh, from those, you know, related organs. So we started with uh, gastrointestinal, starting from colon tissues, and we can actually expand to more actually data set. This is right now is $4.7 million project under the consortium of the Ontario Research Fund, Research Excellence, which is approved uh, from University of Toronto. And there are several collaborators to the pathologists, uh, uh, collaborated to the projects, including from the the pathology clinics, as well as, you know, the other uh, research institutes. Uh, what we have done, uh, we have developed an online uh, annotation, cloud annotation tool. So we can actually dump in these images to, uh, to that cloud annotation server. And then we're, at, we're asking every interested pathologist to join with us and help us in annotating these actually, you know, uh, tissues, the labels. And uh, it is very, uh, there's a lot of revisions that has been done from the original work. And uh, the vision is really to like, you know, um, uh, uh, to, to release a segments of these data sets for the academic research purpose only. Uh, let's say in the next coming workshop in uh, machine learning conferences, we can announce these actual data sets soon. Um, I have like, you know, two minutes. Uh, there are several actually applications, you know, uh, machine learning actually, uh, you know, uh, foundational algorithms that I have developed with my team uh, for the past few years. Uh, the first one is that using the same data set, the ADP data set, we were able to actually develop a pipeline to classify the tissues on the pixel level, which is the, called a weekly supervised semantic segmentation approach. We published this in Seoul, Korea, in ICC back in the 2019, as well as the, it's published in an international journal of computer vision. Another work was that, okay, so I talked about how I can, maybe I can infer the cancer out of, you know, the ADP because ADP are healthy data set, right? Well, when it comes to the clinical diagnosis, diagnosis, pathologists, you know, concentrate on certain uh, tissue uh, structures, tissue types. We call them the diagnostically relevant HTTs or histological tissue types. For example, when it comes to colon, they concentrate on a certain epithelial structure as well as the lymphocytes. So it means that if you can actually, you know, develop a pipeline that can well represent that ADP data set, maybe you can uh, transfer the same, the distill the knowledge, we call it, you know, this from source domain to target domain. So you can bring this uh, similar looking tissues, which are cancerous, you can pass it through the pipeline and you can infer whether they are abnormally looking or, you know, normally looking uh, tissues. In fact, our study actually proven this. We, we noticed that the prediction of the AI, which we call it the confidence score in terms of, you know, what kind of tissues existed. When you concentrate on those diagnostic relevant tissues, we noticed that the progression of the cancer rate is statistically correlated with the uh, progression of the, you know, the, uh, the, the confidence score of the AI prediction. And in fact, we evaluate this on the slide level for colon polyp detection, and our pathologists were amazed by the results. Oh yeah, this is actually really actually detecting the polyps level. Uh, just a few seconds before I wrap it up. There's a lot of actually other studies that we we taught, we studied the knowledge distillation transfer learning algorithms, to how the ATP crosstalk with other data sets in pathology uh, published in, you know, ICAST 2022 and the other data sets, CVMSA uh, 2021. A another actually uh, good work that I have actually recently, uh, you know, have done with, uh, with my students is that, is there any way I can actually uh, uh, design a, uh, the, the deep learning algorithm, al algorithmic model, like, you know, to, rep to well represent these multi-label structures. Uh, so uh, it, they are statistically correlated and there's a lot of meaning to that. Maybe I should stop here, uh, Wendy. Um, uh, so maybe I can take some questions because I know that I'm running out of the time right now. What do you no think? No worries. Um, it, it, uh, we do have just one question, but if you wanna go for a couple more minutes, um, finish, okay. that's fine. Okay, okay, sure, sure thing. Okay. Um, 
Uh, yeah, uh, so those, those were the uh, applications that I've done in the uh, computational pathology, but maybe just a few minutes about my own, you know, advances in deep learning, like, and how it relates to medical imaging. So uh, I'd like to actually bring your attention to uh, the work that I'm doing on developing these, um, you know, we call it the uh, generalization metrics for deep learning. Well, deep learning is known as to be a black box to our community, right? So for computer science community. So what, I, what, what, uh, what are we doing really is that developing meaningful metrics so you can probe into intermediate layers of these deep learning pipelines to understand the training mechanisms are involved down the process. And what the beauty of this work is that actually, if you want to see if your model has been trained well, you don't need the data. You can actually take a look at the pre-trained model and probe these metrics, aggregate them, and you know, uh, which you can quantize it as it becomes a you know score level, and then we notice that there's a high correlation between this score level of measurement levels with the performance level uh, of the of, of the model. So we took these measurements and applied it into a lot of different applications. The uh, the most no, most noticeable one is the one I published in back in the CDPR last year. Uh, we took these measurements and developed uh, you know, uh, a stochastic optimization algorithm to guide, to augment basically uh, you know, um, these, uh, the, the, these uh, metrics to guide the basically hyperparameter tunings like the learning rate of the deep learning algorithms to better optimize these methods, uh, uh, these pipelines. Um, this was published in CVPR. Another actually good work was that we took these metrics and uh, started to search for better hyperparameters for the initial start. So going through just a few epoch training, we find actually best performing hyperparameters and then deploy that through all the training you know, method, uh, phase to basically reach the uh, way good you know, performances. And this was actually published in NeurIPS back in 2021. Another actually work we did, we took these metrics and uh, you know, um, uh, the search for better better architectures. So one of the actually the remedies of the uh, you know in existing architectures they are heuristically designed uh, uh, with you know when it comes to like you know, certain high parameters such as channel sizes of the uh, these deep learning models they are heuristically defined. So what we did we uh, using this metric we developed an automated actually algorithm which searches through a better configuration of these hyperparameters to better represent these models with less computational uh, footprint, uh, maintaining with high uh, you know, performance accuracies. Um, another actually good work which we merge our architecture search with computational pathologies that we develop uh, more efficient compact models, like lightweight models, which performs really well on the pathology you know, data set. Uh, 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 and at the same time, it has uh, way less computational footprint compared to generic architectures from computer vision. And just our recent work, which uh, got accepted in ICASP this year, is the, is the actually another actually genotype architecture we designed to better represent these actually, you know, uh, computer vision data as well as the computational pathology data sets. We're showing that, you know, with these genotypes, we can actually achieve more compact uh, models uh, compared to their, you know, uh, to their baseline methods. Uh, as you can see that I'm into more efficiency and compacting these deep learning algorithms. The reason for that, when it comes to computational pathology data, they are gigapixel images. And from each gigapixel image, you can extract tons of, you know, image mosaics or patches. And obviously you want more compact, more efficient model to process them. So that's the, really the incentive here. So if I want to put it in the perspective, uh, my interest is really to develop efficient, uh, you know, data sets uh, for computational pathology. Uh, so, uh, and, and, and also develop more efficient architectures to represent these actually models, as well as developing more meaningful optimization algorithms to blend them together for efficient representation learning models. So hopefully that makes sense. I didn't want to make it more detailed, but that's really, you know, the, the, really the end of it. And this is my ongoing collaboration with several actually, uh, you know, um, uh, research centers. These are my actually uh, collaborators from different, you know, universities, University of Toronto, St. Michael Hospital, Kingston General, Sunnybrook, uh, uh, recently with Chum Hospital, as well as University of Waterloo, Hurantia Pathology. And uh, guess what? I'm actually, you know, uh, building my own lab at Concordia. So 
I'm, uh, you know, I've hired, you know, half a dozen students. I'm actually hiring more. So hopefully in the next coming year or two, we will expand. Well, thanks so much. So that would be really the end of it. Thank you very much. That was really wonderful. Um, so I'm just going to remind uh, the participants that if you do have a question uh, to enter it in the Q&A feature, uh, I see uh, someone has raised their hand. Uh, so I'm just going to take a couple of uh, questions first, and then uh, we could also unmute you as well. Okay. Um, so our first question, um, which was asked uh, a little bit more in the middle of your uh, talk, was what type of annotations are more useful as they come from the pathologists? Right, right, very good questions. Um, well, obviously, uh, if you wanna be greedy, you might wanna ask the pathologist to annotate on a very granular level. So like no pixel level, let's say, but that's not the possibility. So there should be somewhere between because you cannot basically uh, use their time like that. Um, so currently we have the, uh, labels, annotated labels on the slide level. So because when you have the tissue slides, you know that from where, which primary site is coming from. Also, if the facility has been digitized, they already has been diagnosed on the slide level. So they tell you that what kind of cancer exists on the slide level. So there is a sheer volume of, you know, these data set in our community that they are weekly supervised data sets. So, and because of that, you will see a lot of actually uh, weekly supervised learning models, such as contrast of learning, self-supervised techniques, weekly supervised methods. Uh, if I want to really uh, answer to the question that's being asked, I would say it depends on the application. If the application is about just telling us what cancer this slide has, maybe you only need annotation on the slide level. But if you are looking for an application, let's say diagnostic, diagnostics, let's say uh, classifying the tissue, obviously you need more granular actually type of annotations. It really depends on the application that you're looking for to develop. Great. Uh, we have another uh, question that was submitted. Uh, the question, are you planning on developing models suitable low configuration devices so that such diagnostic methods can reach underdeveloped social groups? If so, how are you planning on going about it? Yes, yes, it's a very good question. Uh, uh, yes, obviously, definitely I am on it. Like uh, my track record shows that I'm, uh, you know, for the past two, three years, I'm uh, trying to develop these efficient models to better process these images because they are gigapixel images. And I can't comment on my, you know, uh, my next steps, like, you know, uh, because we haven't published them yet, but uh, I would say that they are more explainable, more interpretable, and because interpretability is very important when it comes to com uh, our community, medical imaging community, because what you develop, regardless of the model development, decision processes, if you can explain what's happening in the process, it becomes more attractive to the, you know, the medical community as well. Great. Uh, so we have uh, one attendee that has raised their hand, Dr. Christopher Steele. Uh, so Christopher, I have unmuted you whenever you're ready. You can ask your Great. question. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yes. yes, we can. Great. Thanks very much for the talk. Really, really interesting work. Um, I, I had kind of a, a talk from, a, I guess, a little bit more well, you, you've already covered it a little bit in your last answer, but a bit from a practical perspective. So if I wanted to go and implement some of these, actually, it's a two-part question. If I wanted to go and implement some of these um, approaches, like let's say I'm a clinician and I want to sit down and I want to have you know, some results, what kind of processing power do I need to do this? And what kind of, like, what's the scale of computational resources that I'm yes. going to need? Because obviously these are, right, these are gigapixel images and let's yes. say I have, 400 of them that I want to process. Right, and right. Now, is there a scalable architecture for that? Like what kind of processes are there for that? And is that necessary to develop or do things like czar and such already take care of that? Yeah. That yes, kind of yes, yes, uh, definitely. So uh, the vision is to actually really uh, keep it at the edge device level when it comes to clinical uh, application in future. Let's keep in mind that, you know, as I said, like in the, during the you know presentation and the survey paper, I kind of touched base on and mentioned that majority of these work are not integrated in clinical pathology yet because there's a lot of downsides of that. One of them is the computational resources that it, they, they take because when it comes to our community, uh, many actually practitioners, they take the off the shelf solutions model and develop it on these gigapixel images. Um, so 
my my attention is that to avoid that right from the beginning. So I try to develop my own models to become more efficient because I value that efficiency a lot for sure. Uh, and my publication publication track records also you know uh, indicates that um, it is feasible in the next coming like you no know, year or so that you will you 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 will see that you know we have way more efficient models that you know they can perform on these gigapixel images using just for commodity platforms let's say you know uh, just the edge device such as you know pc integrated perhaps with one gpu and that's doable but currently you have you need more advanced you know uh, server uh, clusters to perform on that scale level hope that answers the question yes thank you very much so we have another submitted question um, so the question is, we have seen examples of AI and NN have certain bias related to the data feed into it. Due to how subjective this pathology can be, how are ways to create models that are not biased? Yes, well, uh, when it comes to AI, everything starts with the data. So this is the, you know, the, you get this, uh, you know, questions a lot. And I think there is a unique answer to that. That's my own unique answer to that. It's, when, it's, when it starts with, you know, the AI, it starts with the data, right? So right from the beginning, you are biasing regardless whether you like it or not, right? So let's say if you are, uh, you know, developing a certain application, let's say for breast cancer, obviously you are limiting yourself to breast like, uh, tissues, as well as, you know, a certain cohort of that, you know, representation, as well as limited digitization representation as well, because let's keep in mind that these data sets are digitized version of scanners, scanning tools, right? These tools are not actually standardized, even though, you know, in, when you take like one camera to another, they're not gonna exactly represent the same color representation, right? As well as, you know, when it, the tissue gets stained in the chemical, you know, uh, processes in the pathology lab, moving from one laboratory to another, these representations are also different. So you will see diversity on these, you know, data set representation. To accomplish that, to overcome these issues, uh, you, you can actually think about like you know, several techniques in our you know community, computer science community, such as you know um, data augmentation, data distillation, uh, knowledge distillation tools, out of distribution you know uh, modules, meta learning, active learning. So these are the, actually the tools you can perhaps overcome um, uh, these challenges. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I'll just give uh, everyone maybe a few seconds. We don't have any more questions. If anyone has one last question, we have two couple minutes left. You could also just raise your hand. All right, so I don't see any questions. Um, so I just want to thank you uh, very much for the wonderful talk that you gave today. Um, it will be posted on our website uh, in the coming days. And uh, I hope everyone has a lovely afternoon. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure to be here. You're welcome. Take care, everyone. Yep, bye-bye.